Hello, everyone. Welcome to another installment of Insecurity. We are on episode 16, and we want to call this Epic Hack really part two, but this is the first Epic Hack that we're going to talk about. I'm Haim Cohen, and again, we have Tom Webster here to explain how epic of a hack this was. And indeed, it was epic. Um, this hack rings very familiar to those of us who uh, a couple years back heard the harrowing tale of a uh, Wired writer, Matt Honan, and uh, how he got essentially his entire digital life stripped from him in a matter of hours, um, and how he was you know, just about completely powerless to stop it. And it all centered around customer service policies, really poorly implemented customer service policies, and really mediocre social engineering. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at what happened this morning, what happened back then, and how unfortunately nothing's really changed. And the really scary part is any anything that we've told you to do, the companies can just behind your back accidentally not do it, and you're the one that's going to get stuck. Exactly. So you want to take us through this? Yes. So the basic story of what happened is this. Um, so um, let me get to the guy's name because I keep butchering the pronunciation, and I, I apologize for this. Uh, but Naoki Hiroshima um, posted a story to the cybersecurity section of Medium, which is a place where you can go and tell stories. It's, it's kind of a cool site. Go check it out. Um, the title of the story, which interested, which got everyone interested, was how I lost my $50,000 Twitter username. Apparently, this guy had at the letter N, just N as in Nancy, one letter, that was his Twitter handle, and people were offering him gobs and gobs of money. People were trying to hack him for a long time, you know, sending password reset emails trying to get this thing from him. Um, because he's, he's generally a, a well-known guy in the tech industry. He's, you know... Not Leo Laporte, but he's not Joe Schmo off the street. He's the creator so, of Echofon, the Twitter, the, tw the it's a decent Twitter client. Yeah. So yeah, he's he's got some visibility. Um, so he not only lost his Twitter account, he was basically extorted into giving up the username so this hacker could go claim it. Um, what happened is he first got an email from GoDaddy that said account settings change confirmation. And he's just like, huh, this is this is weird. Um, okay. So he called GoDaddy and he said, uh, hey, what's what's up with this? I didn't authorize any changes to my account, but they wouldn't believe him because the person who had broken into his account already changed all of the information. He couldn't verify his own identity because they had changed names, they had changed credit card numbers, they had changed addresses. They changed all the questions that GoDaddy asks you to make sure that you are the owner of the account. They changed it to completely different information. He was locked out. And then he, uh, he got an email from a, uh, from a hacker and it said, hey, look, I've, uh, I've got your, or, well, I'm getting things out of order. So his, uh, his MX records were changed, which MX records control where mail goes. If you change an MX record to point to a different server, um, mail will flow to that different server. So if you've got your own email, which this guy had because he's a professional developer, um, his mail will start going to a different server. So they now, you know, they had his GoDaddy account, which had his domains, which had his MX records, which pointed where his mail went. So they had all of his email accounts now. They had everything. They had his email address without hacking his email. All they did is they called GoDaddy and they, they said, hey, uh, I can't get into my account. And the GoDaddy representative basically told him or let him guess the last four digits of a credit card. And said, well, it, it kind of ends in these two, but I'll, I'll tell you what, just keep on guessing until you get it. The hacker eventually got it. Well, well, let me stop you there. It, from what I read is that he had two of the four digits. 
And I right. don't know how right. he got two of the four digits. Like, I think he got the first two of the last four. And then the Twitter, per the, the paper, I'm getting this mixed up. The GoDaddy person said, oh, I'll try the other the other bunch of them. Right. And and let's let me mention this. So GoDaddy does offer two factor authentication. Two factor authentication of course is, you know, you try to log into GoDaddy and you get a text message or you it says put in a code and you either, you know, you go to your phone and you either put in Google Authenticator codes or you get a text message and you've got to punch that in on your keyboard. They've got two factor authentication. When you go through the customer service representative, as long as you can identify yourself to the representative, two factor is thrown out. They disable it. That's all you need. All you need to do is trick the GoDaddy guy to get into your account. You don't need authentication. You don't need to read off your full credit card number. You don't need any of this stuff. All you need is to either guess the account pin or, you know, guess apparently two random digits of a credit card number. And if the guy's going to sit there on the phone and let you keep trying to guess, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. And you know, keep in mind, when you go to any store and pay by credit card, just about every place has got the last four digits of your credit card number on the receipt. So does your pizza guy. There you and, go. We learned, and we learned that from Matt Honan. He said basically your pizza guy has your address and the last four digits of your credit card number. And and I thought this was a big slap in the face when Apple and Amazon uh, lost it, where they stopped and they reevaluated their policies. You would think that others would have done the same thing and said the last four are not – they shouldn't be identifiable information, but apparently it is. Right. You, you should never authenticate someone by the last four digits of a, of a credit card. I mean, honestly, go to a gas station sometime, look in the trash can, just look. There are receipts everywhere because, you know, a, a lot of people are people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll take a receipt, and, you know, they throw them somewhere, or they throw them out. It happens all the time. But you've got pieces of paper, quite literally, littering the streets with these last four digits of your credit card, and sometimes receipts have your name on them. So if you're trying to target someone, if, if you're trying to, you know, go spear phishing and say, hey, my name is this, here's the last four of my, my account, info, or uh, the last four of my credit card, I can't get into my account. Could, I think I forgot my username and my password. Could you guys tell me what it is? I guarantee you that hack would work. And it's, it's not a computer hack. As always, we are seeing that, you know, Kevin Mitnick taught us this decades ago. Decades ago, he he taught us that yeah you can break into computers with exploits, but you know it's it's not easy. It's hard. It takes a lot of time. No, no, just exploit the humans. Exploit the wetware. It's really easy to trick a person. It's kind of difficult to trick a computer. Well, the computer has no emotion. What I keep on saying is is Amazon has a responsibility to help people get into their account. Because if they don't, people are not going to buy stuff. People are going to tell their friends how difficult it was to manage. And why do you want to work with a company where if you forget your login, they're going to make you jump through so many different hoops. So you have to balance what is appropriate and what and what is convenient and what is secure. And, and so you... Even though you're in the middle of the road, if you start acting belligerent to the customer service rep, you can probably get just about anything you want as long as you make some sort of sense. I need my account. I'm trying to buy this. I really need it. Can you help me? I don't remember my password. And if you do that enough times and to enough people, one of them will crack. Yeah. And it really makes me sad because, you know, and this is – this is several years ago before GoDaddy went off the deep end, and they say, no, no, really, we support SOPA. We, we support it. We think it's a great idea. Before they went crazy and jumped off the deep end with that, um, I, I was a customer of theirs, and most everyone I talked to was reasonably intelligent. So it, it really kind of breaks my heart that, that either, A, you know, they hired somebody that was so far below the bar to, you know, offer up half of an authentication credential, let alone let someone stay on the phone and try to keep guessing. I, I mean, we don't know how long that took, but it, it could have been hours for all we know. It could have been, you know, 30 minutes of him just yelling off numbers. I mean, all you have to do is count to 100. That's really easy to do. Um, 
but you know, it's either they hired someone that far below the bar, or the bar has been lowered that much. And it's really a sad thing to see. But GoDaddy is not the only company at fault here. They're the big one because when you own a domain that someone's using for email that they use to log into things, you own everything. Because if you can reroute email, you can click reset password on any site, and guess what? You get all those links. They all flow to whatever server you point them to. So it's really, really dangerous. And email, email is really, really important to make sure that you don't lose control of that. So the other... Go ahead. I was going to say, and he says that later on on how to stay secure, but it starts off, I was going to say, how, let's, let's start from the beginning. It starts with PayPal. And somehow, and they don't exactly explain exactly how, there he was able the the hackers were able to get his the last four digits from PayPal, and I don't know how I don't know how you excuse PayPal for this. It's inexcusable, because yeah. they're supposed to be secure. They're supposed to start stop all these hacks, but they literally they just called and said, "Hey, I can't find. I need the last four digits of my credit card number for whatever reason. I can't find my credit card. Can you just get it for me?" And no one thought to say, well, why don't you just log in and get it? Or, uh, I would say this, maybe PayPal obscures uh, the 12 out of the 16 digits, and since everyone knows the last four, what's the big deal? And I think yeah. it's the second one. What's the big deal? And they just gave it to him. Yeah, because, I mean, on one hand, on one hand, you have these companies that, you know, like Amazon, like Apple, in the case of Matt Honan, that realize, oh, wow, okay, guys, we need to change up our policies. We need to not, you know, let slip any user information, no matter how seemingly trivial. And that's where social engineering starts. With is where you gather seemingly trivial information, piece it together, and then use it to exploit your target. Uh, it's it's the bread and butter of social engineering. It's exactly what Kevin Mitnick did, and it's exactly how both of these hacks worked out. But you know, I, I'm sure to PayPal, they're just thinking, well. Everyone knows the last four, and there can't be a company that relies on that for your only authentication method over the phone. I mean, no one would do that. That's crazy. And uh, they're just like, yeah, no, sure, you're going to have everyone's last four of the credit card. We don't care. But, I mean, it's, it's social engineering 101. You can't give an inch. And unfortunately, it means customer service experiences are going to get worse. It means that, you know, the guy that was going to be super helpful for you they have to be trained to treat you like an enemy combatant. They have to be trained to treat you like you're just some guy trying to break into someone else's account until you can convince them otherwise. So we're and all having, criminals. We're all basically, yes. every time we get over the phone, it's not good enough to just say hello. We have to prove ourselves every single time, which, like, and you're right, it's going to make customer service so much worse because they're not going to let you continue until you identify yourself. Right. So I, I used to work at, you know, a classic help desk um, type job. And we went through this. It, was, it, it wasn't, you know, nuclear launch codes or anything, but it, it wasn't trivial stuff. I mean, our, our databases had socials and other things. Um, so we went through, uh, it was drilled into us from day one, you know, this security policy of, hey, you know, they have to pass these five different checks of random disparate information that you can't get by just Googling someone. And they've got to get all of these things, and if they don't get all of these things, they can't do anything to that account. You can't tell them anything. There are no hints. There are no you know, retries. They've got to have these distinct pieces of information, no less. And uh, it's unfortunately, it really affected some people negatively. There were, I, I'm sure... I talked to people that were completely legitimate, that were only trying to get their account back or log into their account. I said, look, I, I can help you, but you're going to have to physically come to my location with two forms of identification and a, a current address with your name on it and I, a piece of mail with a current address and your name on it, and I will unlock your account. But until you do, I am not touching it. I am not allowed to touch it, and I've got to end the call. Sorry. Well, and it, it, it's this a happens a lot. Situation. Well, this happens a lot, and it happens with me all the time because I'm the one that's home early. I have time to call the different things, and I do a lot of banking under 
under the family name, and sometimes the accounts are under my wife's name. If I need to do something, I need her social security number. I need, and they call me, what's her social? And I say, is there anything else I can give you? We're married, I just don't know it. And that's a reasonable excuse. People don't know their spouse's specific social security number, but, like the whole thing, but they know everything else, their birthday, their address, their cell phone, any Hopefully other sort of ID. That. Hopefully what? you know her birthday. Yes, which I do. <laughs> but it's like, how do you get this and and you forget it and now you have to say call back. I just waited 10 minutes on the phone for you to get on and now I have to give you this piece of information. And you almost want to say, and I've said this before, okay, I'm going to call you back with that information. What else do you need? And at that point, they should say, well, sir, we really can't tell you. We really need her here present. As soon as you get her on the phone, we'll identify her She'll authorize you, and then we're done. But they don't do that. They, you get the social security number, which is generally enough, and then you can go from there. Right. And, and you know, I, I have to say, and we really have to stress this, um, this social engineering hack, this alone does not make GoDaddy a bad company. This breach alone does not make PayPal or Amazon or Apple a bad company because, you know what, at the end of the day, what is customer service's job? Customer service's job is to make you happy. And, you know, for people, these aren't bad guys. These aren't malicious people, and they aren't dumb either. These are people that that really want to help people. I mean, so, yeah, it's, it's a job like any other job. But, you know, some of these guys get into it because they say, you know, I remember when I called once and someone was really cool to me over the phone, fixed my problem. We've all had great customer service experiences before. Some people get into that job to do that for people every day. I know most of, I mean, most of Amazon's customer service representatives are just downright pleasant to talk to. They're just great. Every time I've emailed them with even trivial stuff, they save the world. And that's how social engineering works. Unfortunately, they exploit the people who want to help the most. They, they appeal to our, our sense of humanity, our sense of camaraderie, our, our empathy. And they say, hey, look... Yeah, I'm having a really bad day. I can't get into my account. You know, they make people want to help them, and unfortunately, this—I mean, it's its the worst parts of human nature that are going to make customer service representatives very, very touchy when it comes to security issues. And it's really the only choice we have at this point. So, what, did we finish on how we got how they got in? They called PayPal. And somehow convince them that he was an employee. I mean, Kevin Mitnick used to do this right. great, where you just have to say, "I'm an employee from the other plant. Uh, I need help." They got the they got two of the four digits. They, then they hang up, call GoDaddy, and say, "Hey, I got I got the four digits, but I I wrote it down a little sloppily. Can you check?" They check. They get in. They change the MX records. They change all the who is information, essentially locking him out of his account. And then they do the password resets. And again, all they were after was the Twitter account. And that yeah. was it. And they said, look, we can we can ruin your life right now, or you can just give us the password to the Twitter account. Well, that's all we want. And he and he conceded and said, here it is. And they took it. They left everything intact, but he lost his Twitter account. Yeah, and, and so Twitter is looking into this, and – most likely the guy will get his account back. I mean, we can only hope, right? Because this, this thing blew up. Now, somebody did point out, what if it's the hacker that wrote this article? What if it's just the hacker trying to create such a buzz and such a stink around this story that he ends up getting awarded the Twitter account for, you know, going viral? I and thought that about be, that. I thought that exactly that. Would that would and, be amazing. And, and that you know would what, be a great social engineering hack. It would be. And at that point, if you can go ahead and, and you know throw up a story and get hacker news and get Reddit riled up, you get wired to write about you, I mean, at that point, you might just have to give him the Twitter account out of sheer respect. I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, it would be a horrible thing to do, but you got to really respect that. That's I mean, that's not easy to pull off. Um, well, anything now from at N, I don't know who it is. Right. And um, if you're the Twitter developer... Has actually, Twitter shut down that uh, that account. So if you go to twitter.com slash just the letter N, 
um, it says, uh, sorry, that page doesn't exist. So clearly they're so, looking they're looking into it and figuring it right. out and everything else. But and, and then you read the suggestions. The the best the best part of this whole thing are the suggestions. The first thing he says is avoid custom domains for your login email address. And the idea was um, the idea was that they change the MX records. So two factor I don't think would have necessarily stopped it. Right. Because you couldn't get in. You point the MX record somewhere else to your own domain, and then you get it. And you really, really have to know what you're doing if you're playing around with MX records. This is not – it's not yeah. hard to do, but it's even following directions, it's kind of tricky. It's it's not script kitty level stuff. Somebody didn't just, you know, sit down at their computer and start hammering away at keys like you see in all these crime show dramas. Uh, this, this was a guy – this is a hack spent 90% on the phone with someone getting information and changing things. And it's just like, oh, yeah, no, just redirect the email and stand up an email server and grab all the password reset messages and take over all of his accounts after I change all the information. Um, we, we do have to mention that, you know, it would be great if GoDaddy, when, when the actual account owner called, when he got the email that said, hey, stuff on your account has changed, if this isn't you, if it shouldn't have changed, give us a call. And they give you a phone number right there in the email. So he got that email from GoDaddy. But he called, and apparently this guy had changed all of his information so fast that it, the guy could no longer authenticate. What should happen is they, uh, they should do versioning on everything. They, they should do you know snapshots of every time you change a phone number, every time you change, you know, hair color on a form. It should it should keep little snapshots of each change you make. So GoDaddy can go, hold on, wait, you're saying somebody took over your account, changed all your information. Well hold on. Hold on, Mr. Smith. Let me let me go back a few pages. Okay. Let me go back to a month ago. A month ago? Okay. Well there was no transfer here. Yeah, this looks entirely different. You say it happened an hour ago. Yep, that's what I'm seeing here. Okay. Let us switch all of that over. Lock down the account. That's that's an easy way. That's an easy thing to train. It, it would have solved this issue right away. And I think that's going to be the way most of these companies go. Um, but, I mean, you don't know. Because, so, this same exact hack happened years ago. But still, some companies are playing by the old rules. And you really can't anymore. Security is not a, uh, no company is an island. So if, if uh, your security hack that somebody used against you, they could use it against your neighbor next week. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's an isolated incident. Well, so they change the MX records, like you said, and version control, I, I think you're, you hit it right on the head, needs to happen. And I would take it a step further. If you got, if you call and said, oh, now we have a discrepancy, we need to, we need to bolt, we're going to shut everything down until you can re-verify everything and let the other person re-verify everything and go from there so you can try and do something. And this, this will take time. It won't happen over the phone, but it will, it will obviously be more secure. The other thing he's saying is two-factor wouldn't have helped, and I think in certain cases, his Google Apps account, since it's no longer pointing there, the reset emails go somewhere else, that wouldn't have helped. But PayPal, right. he says, using two-factor authentication is a must. It's probably what prevented the attacker from logging into my PayPal account. Yep. So so to, he, this guy clearly read that you needed to have two-factor. So he put two-factor on everything he could, I guess except for GoDaddy. Because, again, right. what's the weakest link? You can't. I guess you should two-factor all the things, but at some point all the things become a real big pain. And it, now, it does, yeah. but it wouldn't have helped GoDaddy. Because uh, someone someone left a comment on the Medium article and they said, "Hey, you know, I just called GoDaddy. I explained to them the article I just read. Everyone knows about it." I said, uh, "I asked the guy I was talking to, can I, if I give you my account pin or the last four of a card, could I disable two factor?" He said, "Yeah, that's our policy." So even if he would have had two factor authentication on his GoDaddy account it wouldn't have helped the social engineering attack, which is really the crux of the entire hack. It's, it's what made everything possible. Um, if you want a book on this, I highly suggest 
you read Kevin Mitnick's book. I want to say it's uh, uh, Ghost in the Wires. Yeah, that's his biography. Yes. Yeah, take a look and at yes, Ghost in the Wires. Good. And uh, also pick up, uh, there's an older book called uh, The Art of Deception that he helped write, which is a fantastic book all about social engineering, and there are some great hacks in there. Really great hacks. And then just for essence of time, the other thing he was saying is, and I agree with him, and I actually, I was telling Tom before the show, I actually do this without knowing. Use your, he said, use your vanilla Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo account. Something completely separate. So if this does happen, you can't change. You can't go to Google or Yahoo and change GMX records. But he also said, have a different account for this stuff. So I have a separate account besides the one I, I personally use that no one else knows except for me to log in with stuff. So if you send email to that account, it's so you either don't know me or it's just marked as spam. They're for newsletters and everything else, and it's spelled differently. So if I got a, so if they spell my name one way and they send it to a different account, it's really hard. It's just it's just plain obscurity, and I didn't know that I was doing it and that was the right idea until I thought about it. Because if you have an internet presence and a personal pre uh, presence, it's hard for people to distinguish the two unless they really know you. Right, and and the reason that a plain vanilla Gmail account. Um, if, if he would have used that for all of his login information, for all of his you know, account sign-ups, this would not have happened. And the thinking behind it is, and it's, it's really hard to tell people to do this because, you know, using your own email is something you control that's not going through a provider that, you know, you've got on your boxes, your servers that you're renting in the cloud or, or however you manage it, is a really great thing. It's a really powerful thing. It's a really professional thing. But it can also get pushed over easily. One thing that can't be hacked easily is, uh, you know, Microsoft's MX, MX records or Google's MX records. Do you think, you know, the people that control Google's MX records, um, do you think you could uh, easily social engineer them? Yeah, not, not really. We no. have a bigger problem no. if that happens. Right, right. If you can do that you probably deserve, like, a Lifetime Achievement Award or something else because that is impressive. Um, but, uh, so, you know, can, can you change Yahoo's? No. Google? No. Microsoft? No. So, you know, for your login stuff, stand up a Gmail account, stand up a Hotmail account, whatever you want, Outlook.com. Who cares? Something that's, you know, backed by a big company that you can sit back and think, you know, if some guy tried to social engineer... Um, Microsoft, how successful would they be? And then sit back and think about that for a while, and then make that thing your login account. Choose a big provider. I mean, we have the whole problem is what happens if you're signing up for something you shouldn't be signing up for? Is the NSA spying on you? And yeah. all this other stuff stuff and running it through your server now was GoDaddy working with the NSA we have no idea and they won't tell us or they're not allowed right. to tell us and what's going on with that but again if you're signing up for just specific accounts I take the hit on the privacy just to get it in and then go from there it, right. uh, now, enable two factor said, and everything if, else uh, if your email account if, if your email is coming to you you know Bob at Donations for Al Qaeda .net. Um, The NSA is probably already watching you, so you know, can't really get around that. And then the other thing is, and we and we, we hit on it a few weeks ago, but the Twitter two factor. If he had Twitter two factor, that that would have also saved him. But Twitter two factor only works on the default and uh, the default app, and he's clearly writing a much better Android app that I guess Twitter won't allow him to use the the two factor methodology. Right. So, again, if you're – and he knew – see, the one thing that bothers me the most, he knew that this was important to him. And somehow – and he was getting all these confirmation password resets to try and get it. I guess he thought, oh, I have two-factor, I have this. He didn't think that GoDaddy and um, and PayPal would, would sell him out. Exactly. So, anyway, we got to go where it's that time. So, look – it was. It's just stay safe on the internet, people. That's yep. all we can say. Have a good night. See you guys. Bye. Oops, stop.